welcome to Developmental Psychology Unit 5. As you can see, this unit is on cognitive development and many of the individual pieces that construct our cognitive abilities. Before we jump into the individual cognitive skills, however, we're going to talk briefly about two main theorists in the area of cognitive development. The first theorist we're going to talk about is, of course, Jean Piaget. So Jean Piaget's contribution to the area of cognitive development cannot be overstated. Still to this day, he's the only person that has really provided a comprehensive lifespan approach, combining and synthesizing many of our cognitive skills. In particular, Piaget's theories took a more qualitative and discontinuous approach as compared to many other theorists. That is, rather than counting how things quantitatively and gradually changed over time, Piaget proposed four distinct stages or phases of development. He believed that in all these stages of development, we grow and develop through experiential learning, hands-on learning, and that children were really constructivists of their own knowledge. That is the idea that letting a child explore with hands-on activities is much more informative and much more effective to their development rather than teaching them and telling them things. So letting a child play with manipulatives can help them to understand math better than just reading about math in a textbook. And understanding the nature of cause and effect with objects is better than just being told how things will play out. He, Piaget also believed that we were all scientists from the start, that infants come into this world primed and ready to take on the world with a scientific method. Through identifying correlations and patterns, connecting the dots, we are able to problem solve and grow. In addition, Piaget introduced us to quite a few different terms that help us to conceptualize and understand cognitive development. And one of those terms is actually a fancy word for concept. It's schema, also called schemes or schemata in psychology. These are groups or categories of things that can make patterns. So we constantly make schemas about things. It might be easiest to understand a schema when it comes terms to things like nouns, but we make schemas about things that are abstract and non-noun based. But for instance, we might have a schema about different types of food. You may have a schema about what types of foods would be categorized as healthy or unhealthy, or what is animal-based versus plant-based, or what types of foods would be categorized as sandwiches. Perhaps you would think a sandwich maybe has two slices of sliced bread, or perhaps a sandwich could include something like a hamburger that could be a, a chicken sandwich or a, a burger sandwich. Maybe you think a taco is a sandwich or a hot dog is a sandwich. Perhaps you don't think a pizza is a sandwich and you have rules about why a pizza would or wouldn't be considered an open-faced or one slice sandwich. And so this is your schema for sandwiches and you might have lots of different rules about what you would classify as a sandwich or not a sandwich. Of course, we could have rules about everything and anything and kids are constantly learning about these rules and categories. This takes up a big component of their early elementary and preschool education, learning about parts of the body, types of clothing, types of fruits and vegetables or animals or seasons or weather. The categorization of everything in the world is a big part of their cognitive development. And so when we're building these schemes, it's important for us to be able to recognize things and organize them into these schemes. And these schemes allow us to interpret things a lot faster. That being said, there's a couple mechanisms at play when we're building these schemes or schematas. And one of them is the mechanism of assimilation. So assimilation in terms of Piaget and cognitive development isn't the same as cultural assimilation. Rather, what we're talking about in this instance in cognitive assimilation is the idea of adding things to your schematic buckets, adding things to your categories. So you can imagine a very young child who understands that dogs are pets. You can have a dog as a pet. They might also start to recognize that you might not have a dog as a pet, but you could have a kitten or a cat as a pet. Then they may have a schema or a category for pets and say, oh, you could have a dog or a cat. And then they might also identify a bunny could be a pet. And if they only really have dogs, cats, and bunnies in their pet schema, they may say that a pet is something that is furry and cuddly, that has four legs and has fuzzy ears. And that might be the way they conceptualize a pet. And so what happens in assimilation is you have a category and things that match the rules of that category can be added to it. It's relatively easy in terms of cognitive work. We're just adding more examples to our category. 
So it's the idea if you're learning about what vegetables are, you might say, okay, so potatoes and carrots are vegetables and asparagus is a vegetable, radishes are vegetables, cauliflower is a vegetable. And as you're learning more and more about vegetables, you start to add things to the bucket or add things to the folder or the schema that would be different types of vegetables. So you already have this existing framework, an existing rule structure for what is a vegetable versus what is a pet. And if you come across something new, perhaps you say an eggplant, you might say, okay, an eggplant doesn't fit my schema for pet, but it might fit my schema for vegetable, so I know where to place it. So assimilation is pretty straightforward and kids do a fascinating job of compiling and organizing this information. But we have a second mechanism that's a bit more tricky, and that is the mechanism of accommodation. So what happens here in accommodation is we can't just constantly assimilate things. Once in a while, we come across information that challenges the rules of our network. It challenges the rules of our framework and our schema. And so what happens here is you might say, okay, well, vegetables are foods that grow in the ground in a garden versus fruits grow up in trees. But then you come across a tomato and you say, well, a tomato grows in a garden beside the carrots and the potatoes. It must be a vegetable. And then someone tells you it's not. A tomato is in fact a fruit. You say, why is it a fruit? It grows in the garden. What's the difference? And they may tell you, well, the seeds are on the inside. And most of the vegetables we just talked about don't have seeds on the inside. This would require accommodation for you to adjust. Oh, so a vegetable versus a fruit isn't growing on the ground versus growing in trees. It's about the part of the plant that we eat. And that may make you rethink other things that need renegotiation. For instance, you might start to think, well, is a pumpkin a fruit or a vegetable then? It also has seeds on the inside. And what about a cucumber with seeds on the inside? Are they fruit as well? Certainly when we think about fruity flavors, we tend to not think about cucumbers and tomatoes. And so what does that mean if they are fruits? And we can also think about if you came across someone who had a pet that was not fuzzy with floppy ears. Perhaps they had a pet snake or spider or bird. Could that be a pet? The first time you come across that, it's going to challenge your schema for pets and you're going to have to readjust those boundaries and accommodate this new information. So assimilation is much more straightforward. We're just compiling information that fits into our already derived categories. Whereas with accommodation, we now have to retool things and reframe things and adjust our mindset to this new information. This is challenging. This can be frustrating. Children have to deal with this on an almost daily basis as they learn about new exceptions to rules and new exceptions to how the world works. However, adults do this much more poorly. Adults still need to accommodate things from time to time, but they tend to become much more frustrated than children. Children, although might get frustrated, they, they can tolerate this a lot better than adults. Adults become much more rigid in their thinking. And when you challenge their schema networks or their frameworks of thinking, they really don't like it. One example could be, of course, trying to identify how there could be non-binary individuals who do not identify as men nor women and trying to say gender is not a binary. It's much easier to try and explain this to a group of elementary children and have them accept it rather than have adults who this is brand new information to them. It's harder for them cognitively to adjust to that information. Now what happens here in assimilation and accommodation is we're constantly striving for the state of equilibrium. And so equilibrium is the idea that everything makes sense. When we are in equilibrium, this is when everything we know and everything we understand fits neatly into its categories, or you can assign everything neatly and tidy to its folders. Nothing's really cross loading, nothing's fitting outside the folders, everything is organized. But when you come across something like is a taco a sandwich or is a tarantula a pet, then this could put you into a state of disequilibrium. And a state of disequilibrium is when there's a bit of an error code popping up in your, in your folder system, or when something is not nicely fitting into the buckets in your mind. And so disequilibrium is when you are in need of accommodation, things are not fitting. What happens is when we're in disequilibrium, things are not making sense. We can't process them. We can't really organize them neatly. And it can be really frustrating. To get back to equilibrium, we have to do the process of equilibration. This is just another word for accommodation in a sense. And equilibration could mean rephrasing the frameworks of our folder system or reorganizing what the folders are defined as or relooking at something and discovering it and understanding it a bit better. And so equilibration is what happens when we're accommodating. And through equilibration, it can bring us back to the state of equilibrium, which is nice and harmonious and we understand things. 
but any given moment and any time of day, we might learn something new that could throw us back into disequilibrium. For instance, let's talk about rainbows. We often depict rainbows as including red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Yet we never really teach indigo as a primary color. Why is that? Just pondering over something simple like that might throw us back into disequilibrium. Now, aside from these definitions that Piaget offered, he also offered an explanation for cognitive development that included four discrete, discontinuous stages. And these four stages were the sensory motor stage, which is really in infancy, the pre-operational thought stage, which is really during preschool years, concrete operational, which is really the elementary years, and formal operational, which is really junior high and beyond. So we're going to talk briefly about these, and then they'll make more sense when we talk about the distinct different cognitive abilities. So with the sensory motor period, that's really from birth to age two. And what Piaget really thought was going on here that was important wasn't so much conscious thinking. He didn't really think kids could have that internal narrative or internal story going on. But more so, it was being conscious of things in the present moment and interacting with the environment. And it was the idea that by kicking a crib, you might make a mobile shake and you might start to associate the pattern of those two things. Or when you're eating food in the high chair, you might start to associate the high chair with mealtime. Or when you drop something out of the high chair, you might start to associate the dropping with the splat. Or if you cry and someone comes to you, you might start to associate that pattern of events. And so what he really believed was an important thing going on in the sensory motor substage was that we develop schemas for lots of events and lots of patterns. We just talked about schemas as it refers to nouns, but it's important to understand we can also have schemas as it refers to cause and effect events. So for instance, you might have a schema about crying and someone comes and changes your diaper or a schema about kicking the crib and the mobile spins and you feel happy. And so you start to develop this association between things and start to connect the dots. This starts off really, really, really gradually. In fact, it starts off with just using our reflexes and just doing things spontaneously. And we're not actually having intention behind things. It's just pure motor reflexes. But then as the motor reflexes start to have an impact on our environment, we start to detect these patterns. We start to do it more intentionally. We start to troubleshoot and try and see how there's other possibilities and other ways to do different behaviors that have similar outcomes. And we start to build these schemas. Now, important to understand that this stage is really called the sensory motor stage because Piaget thought the two big things at play here was our sensation and our motor development, connecting back to what we did in unit three on physical development. When we go into the next stage, however, called the pre-operational thought stage, it's important to understand pre-operational thought means Piaget thought at this stage we were thinking and we were having that internal narrative about our world. And at this stage, our thoughts were considered pre-operational, meaning they weren't really based in anything in reality. This is the stage where we believe in magic and wonder and fairy tales and make-believe. And this is the idea that we're trying to come up with explanations for our world, but because we don't quite understand all the rules of reality yet, sometimes these can include magical thinking or what he sometimes called pre-causal thinking. And so pre-causal thinking could be the idea that if something happened, it was magic, it was make-believe. Piaget also wrote about how children of this age might believe in animism. And this is the idea that believing a puppet is come to life or believing an object has intention. So the idea if they sit down on a chair and the chair is uncomfortable, they might say, the chair hurt me, as if the chair intended to cause harm. Or if they tripped and fell, they might say, my feet tripped me, as if, the tr as if their feet had their own intention outside their central nervous system. So the pre-operational thought stage has lots of wondrous things going on, but it's mainly those preschool years of ages three to roughly age six. And then when we move into the next stage, this has a similar name, and it's the concrete operational thought stage. Moving from pre-operational to concrete operational really means now we're not really thinking about magic and make-believe as much. We're thinking about concrete things in the here and now. And different than sensory motor, it doesn't have to be things that we're present on, but things that make sense to us things that actually have realistic properties. So this is when we're in elementary school. We learn to read and we learn to do math and we like games and we like the rules around games. We can play card games, we can play board games, we can play games like chess. 
Now, even though chess requires a lot of abstract movements, we can use the pieces. And as long as we can use the pieces on the board, we can often follow this in the concrete operational stage. You wouldn't be able to play chess just in your head saying something like uh, king to place X on the board at this stage. That would come later on. But at this stage, as long as we can use calculators, as long as we can write the numbers down on the chalkboard, we can do math operations, and we start to be able to think about things in a much more complex way. And he believed this was really the ages of 7 to 11. And then when we get beyond age 11 to age 12, this was really the formal operational thought stage. Now, Piaget believed what happened in formal operational is now we can play chess in our head. Now we can just do math in our head without writing the numerals down. Now we can think about really abstract concepts like quantum physics or justice or human rights. We can do really complex hypothesis testing and come up with really irrational numbers or abstract terms like infinity. And we can come up with new knowledge and how to create new knowledge or new ways of thinking. So formal operational was considered to be very, very advanced, yet Piaget believed that most people around age 12 could start to have a capacity for it. As you can imagine, there are, of course, criticisms of Piaget's work. One of the big things being he under and overestimated some of the skills in some of his phases. More modern research has shown that he's overestimated what we can do at age 12. In fact, more modern research finds that many of us don't make formal operational thought period. We stay as concrete operational thinkers. He also underestimated the ability of infants and really saying that we really were stuck in the here and now and couldn't think abstractly has been disproven as infants do have a capacity for numeracy and they do have an understanding of some abstract terms. In addition, Piaget thought that all of us pass through these four stages in exactly the same way around exactly the same time, and that's often not the case. Some of us may not pass through them at the same rhythm or at the same length. Some of us may stay in one of the stages longer than others, and there's a lot more flexibility. We might be working in a more abstract way with some things in our life, but a more concrete thing in some of our lives, and that magical thinking can still be present even when we move into the higher levels. So there seems to be more of a blending and much more gradual change than what Piaget originally proposed. Finally, his original proposal really wasn't taking into account differences in terms of cultural and social diversity. Things like how family income or religion might play a role in terms of how we think about the world. Overall, Piaget's contribution is still huge today, but we have to acknowledge these criticisms.